right, so on Friday we were discussing electrons and characteristics of electrons, and we were talking about the difference between electron shells or energy shells and electron orbitals. Thanks for asking. Can't believe you came that girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wish I was that girl, but it's going to great. <laughs> okay, so orbitals. Orbitals become increasingly complex when we move into things like d orbitals and f orbitals and g orbitals. But these are pretty far down on the periodic table. And really, we're worried about pretty much the first 25 elements on the periodic table. So that complexity, we can really reduce that complexity because the four most prominent atoms or elements that we find in biology are going to be carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. You look at proteins, carbohydrates, fats, lipids, hydrolipids, and amino acids. And you're going to find a whole bunch of carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, and nitrogens. So these are really some of our most biologically relevant and electron orbitals can basically be reduced in those four elements to a 1s, 2s, and 2p orbitals. So we're literally talking about just the first part of the thing here. Right None of these more complex orbitals further down the periodic table of elements. Now remember an orbital, what is an orbital? Some of them remind me of more orbitals. What the electrons travel on. It's basically going to be that statistical space where we're most frequently going to find an electron. As we move the distance component, that's more along the lines of the energy shell. Electrons, as they move further and further and further away from the atomic nucleus, they gain energy. They hold more energy, have more potential energy. So the orbital in itself is going to be that statistical space around the atomic nucleus where we're going to most often find the electrons. If I can bring two orbitals in close confirmation to each other from two different atoms, I increase the likelihood that those electrons will be shared or that we'll have some sort of chemical interaction that will occur. Now, there are a handful of elements that we're going to refer to as trace elements. It's trace because they're very low concentrations or low amounts, so trace amounts in biology. And they may go up to a third orbital. And mostly these third orbital elements, these elements that have a third orbital, orbital, they're going to be the really simple ones. They're going to be the 3s, so that kind of spherical shape. And they're going to be 3p. They're going to be more of that dumbbell shape. So we're not getting into these any really complex statistical shapes in biology. That's reserved for chemistry, which is not near as important as biology. You can tell the I said that. So we can basically ignore D, F, and G. That's supposed to be a G, not a T. We can, we can ignore D, F, and G orbitals. I'm very much convinced <clears throat> that all biologists start out as chemists and realize that it's too hard, and so they're like, I need to simplify it and to become biologists. Because biology is really a much simpler form of chemistry because you're not dealing with you're not dealing with really 70% of the of the elements on the periodic table of elements, and they're always the elements that are 
really complex in their orbital and energy shell configurations. Now, due to electrons and their orbitals and their energy shells, we can get this idea of chemical behavior. So an element's chemical behavior is determined by electron configuration. And really, it's going to be the electron configuration in the outer shell. That very outer shell, and we have to remember from chemistry what we call that outer shell. It's going to be our valence shell. And the electrons that are contained in that outer valence shell are known as the valence electrons. So I got a couple examples here, and these are illustrating the energy shells. So boron, you can see in that outer shell, which there's just two energy shells here. Here's our shell one, our shell two. We have three valence electrons. Now, each of these valence electrons are going to also be configured into some orbital. We're going to have a spherically shaped orbital that will contain one of those electrons and then two different p orbitals in remember one of the different axes around that atomic nucleus so two electrons in, in in the two p orbitals one electron in the two s orbital i guess let me rephrase that one in the s orbital two s orbital one in the two p orbital and another in another two Silicon, you can see we have three energy shells. And then out here in antimony, we have one, two, three, four, five balance, uh, five energy shells with five balance electrons in that balance shell. Now, fortunately, antimony, you don't really have to worry about that. That's far outside of the biological realm. But it's just to illustrate that you may have a ton of electrons in an element that don't really do a whole heck of a lot as far as it's coming. It's going to be those five valence electrons out here in the very outer or valence shell. Now, if you look at the periodic table of elements, you'll recognize that you have columns of um, elements as well. You have the rows and you have the columns. And as we move across in the uh, from left to right, we're increasing the number of electrons that are present. We're increasing uh, the number of valence electrons that are going to be able to interact with uh, each other. As we go down, we actually have the same number of electrons, and we have some very uh, some very similar chemical behaviors. Silicon, right above silicon, and you don't know what element it is. It's carbon. Carbon and silicon have some very similar characteristics because they both contain four valence electrons. There's actually theories out there that suggest, you know, right now the search for extraterrestrial life, which I don't really believe that there is any, but you know what I'm saying? It's an interesting conversation, I suppose. We're looking for carbon, right? That's been like one of the big things we've looked to see if there's carbon in other on other planets or other solar systems. Look at concentration of carbon. Because that may indicate that life is possible on those planets. There are theories that states, well, silicon actually has four valence electrons as well. It's chemically uh, behavior from a chemical behavior perspective is similar to carbon. So is there a possibility that they're silicon-based life forms? Now, I would argue that we also uh, have to look at the weight of the molecule as well. Carbon is going to be anatomically much less in mass than silicon, and I think that has some importance as well um, when you're building 
molecules that we use for life. I kind of digress there. Just a bit. The point is the valence electrons are what define the chemical behavior. And you will have similar, similar chemical behavior as you move down that column. So carbon, the basis for organic chemistry, carbon has a lot of different binding partners that it can do because it has those four valence electrons. So it kind of be very simple. And then different uh, binding partners because of the four valence electrons. Now, in terms of valence electrons, a complete or a full valence shell These molecules, or these elements, I should say, are called inert. So it's an inert atom. An inert just simply means unreactive. They call them noble gases because they're refined. It means boring, not Do you have anything? So the inert atom is not going to have any sort of reactive. If you put a noble gas like neon, in the presence of other molecules, it's not, doing, it's not going to do anything. We need to have an open valence shell to have a reactive atom. And this is what we would call fun because something's going to happen. Whenever you have an unpaired electron, that means those electrons are going to be searching a partner. The electrons need to be home. The electrons always want to pair up. So when we're building an atom in that very outer energy shell, the valence shell, we first start, we first start by filling up each individual orbital with at least one electron. So there's either going to be an orbital that has no electron in it or an orbital that just has one. And then once we've filled all the orbitals, then we go and begin to fill up the orbitals with a second electron. So once we have one electron in each of the orbitals, a second electron is that we begin to add to our orbitals. Now, just like I've already mentioned, if we have an equal number of valence electrons, so carbon, silicon, have an equal number or the same number of valence electrons, those atoms will have some chemical similarities. All right, so protons, electrons, neutrons are subatomic particles. As we begin to organize the atomic nucleus, and electrons around that atomic nucleus, we get atoms, and then as we take individual atoms and we begin to put those individual atoms together, the next level of hierarchy is going to be the molecule. So molecules, these are going to be combined atoms, right? We're going to take two different atoms or two or more different atoms or even just two atoms that can be the same atom put them together and now we have by definition a molecule. In a molecule, those valence electrons, which are important for the atom's reactivity, the valence electrons are shared. When we share valence electrons, what do we call that? It's going to be a chemical bond. 
So when we share our valence electron, we're going to get a chemical bond. Formation of chemical bonds is basically what we would call reactivity. Strong bonds today in biology. Okay, so strong bonds. A covalent bond is an example of a strong bond. So just some examples here. If I take two hydrogen atoms and I allow their orbitals to cross, they'll begin to share their electrons across a covalent bond to form a hydrogen molecule. So two atoms become one molecule. So strong bonds, a covalent bond is an example of a strong bond. We're also going to talk about some weak bonds as well. Strong just simply refers to the strength of the bond, how well the bond holds together. It's strong because it's pretty hard for it. Yeah. A was the valence electron per share, share, which equals the chemical bond. Okay, so we have our strong bond, one of our strong bonds, which is called the covalent bond, and the covalent bond is formed by sharing electrons between two atoms. And the way those electrons are going to be shared is the electron shell are going to be made to overlap. The electron shells are made to overlap. When they are made to overlap, overlap we have a reaction where the electrons are going to begin to occupy both shells from both atoms in respective orbits. We are going to represent this as an object that looks like that, basically a bar to represent uh, the covalent bond in structural formula. So for example, this molecule here called the hydrogen molecule, we represent this simply as two H's for the hydrogen atoms and the R for the covalent bond. So that would be the hydrogen molecule. Covalent bonds are going to have this thing called a bonding capacity. Uh, let me rephrase that. That wasn't that wasn't proper. Atoms are going to have this characteristic called the bonding capacity. A bonding capacity is going to be equivalent to the number of unpaired electrons that are present in the atom. Now, if a particular atom has a bonding capacity of just one, that means that it can form just a single covalent bond because of a single valence electron. Covalent bonds also can form double covalent bonds where we have two electrons that are going to be shared. Molecular oxygen is an example of a, a molecule that forms a double covalent bond. So structural formula is going to look something like that. Uh, chemical formula, the ratio would be O2. Now, just because there are two shared or two electrons that can be shared doesn't mean that we're always going to form a double covalent bond. We could also form a bond, another single bond or two single bonds in that atom. So oxygen has a bonding capacity of two, 
infinite bond to itself, like I've shown here in a double covalent bond, or it can bind hydrogen with two single covalent bonds to form one. Another characteristic of covalent bonds that's going to become really important is what's known as bond polarity. So the term polar means that opposite things are happening on opposite sides of an object. So it could be opposite sides of a covalent bond. Um, but just to kind of give this idea, uh, just in more general terms, on Earth, Earth is considered to be polarized because we have a North Pole and we have a South Pole on the planet. So opposite things are happening on either side of the object of the Earth. So in terms of a covalent bond, we could have opposite things happening on either side of that covalent bond. So that covalent bond could become more negative on one side or positive on the other side. What is going to define whether or not the covalent bond becomes polar or nonpolar is the characteristic known as electronegativity. This is a form of the periodic table that's based off of it has a third dimension. So normally you look at an electro or a uh, periodic table and it just has the two dimensions, right? It has kind of the increasing in number of uh, electron shells and then the increase in the number of electrons. This adds a third dimension and called electronegativity. You'll notice that oxygen is one of the highest electrical electronegativities on the periodic table. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, I'm sorry, hydrogen, uh, carbon, and nitrogen are all lower than oxygen. So, this idea of electronegativity simply is a characteristic of the atom and how it pulls, and I'm putting that in parentheses here, kind of quoting this, how that atom pulls on the shared electrons. So oxygen is going to have a high electronegativity, meaning in a shared covalent bond with hydrogen, which has low electronegativity, the electrons are going to be pulled towards the oxygen. So the electrons that are shared are going to end up over here more frequently by the oxygen. Electrons have positive or negative charge? Negative. negative. So if I have all of my electrons clumped up over here, what's going to happen to this side of the covalent bond? It's going to exhibit more of a negative on this side, more of a positive on this side. Now, on either side of this covalent bond, I have opposite things going on, right? Positive versus negative. I'm sorry, positive versus negative. So it's going to create a polar covalent bond. So bond polarity, the atoms have pull on shared electrons, and that's what we're representing here with this part of the axis, the electronegativity. And that electronegativity sort of establishes a tug of war with two atoms that are within that covalent relationship, covalent bond, are pulling at different amounts on the shared electrons. So atoms with equal electronegativity, that's what this refers to. So if they have the same electronegativity, so let's say two oxygen atoms 
how are the electrons going to be distributed around that covalent bond? This is basically that tug of war where both teams are pointing at the exact same string. So two atoms with equal electronegativities will have equal pull on the shared electrons across that bond. So over here, I cannot put in a positive or a negative because the distribution of electrons is equal. And so there's no areas of positive or negative in that covalent bond. When we have that situation, the sides of the covalent bond are not different. So those electrons around the covalent bond they do not create a positive or a negative, and there's no polarity across that bond. Does that make sense? Does everybody kind of see what I'm stepping in? So this type of a bond here, like we have between oxygen, is going to be considered nonpolar. So it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Now what happens if I have different electronegativities? So I have two atoms with different electronegativities. So let's do hydrogen and oxygen. You can see on this figure, oxygen has a very high electronegativity, hydrogen much less electronegativity. Where are the electro electrons going to be? Pulled. Yep, they're pulled towards the oxygen. Electrons always have negative charge. So because there are more negatively charged electrons over here, that means that this side of that polar covalent bond becomes more negative. There are less electrons over here, meaning this side of the, of the covalent bond becomes positive. I'm now exhibiting this characteristic called polarity. Negative is opposite of positive. And so when we have different electronegativity, uh, or atoms of different electronegativity, we end up with a polar covalent bond. I'm just going to abbreviate covalent bond as C. So just really to drive this home, in a situation where we have a polar covalent bond because of two different electronegativities on these two different atoms, we end up with our electrons, those shared electrons, spending more time by one of the atoms in that covalent bond. And so this is now that form of tug of war where one team is winning because they're pulling more strongly on that electron, pulling it towards itself. So as I've already sort of alluded to, H2O, water, is going to be polar. So here you can see a molecule of water. And in that molecule of water, our oxygen atom has a high electronegativity. In other words, it has a very strong influence and pull on electrons. So because of that, the electrons spend more time around the oxygen than they do around the two hydrogen molecules across those two covalent bonds. Each of these covalent bonds is going to be a polar covalent bond. 
Zimmerman got all of this. The consequence of this electronegativity in the pull on electrons is oxygen becomes slightly negative. And it becomes slightly negative because of the increased presence of electrons near that oxygen molecule. Because those electrons are spending more time by the oxygen, they don't spend as much time by the hydrogen in their covalent bond. And so they are, the, the hydrogens are going to be slightly more positive. Now we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about the consequences of polar covalent bonds, especially in reference to water. Um, so we're going to come back to that. We're going to actually come back and go through a bunch of characteristics of water. But I'll tell you, just kind of foreshadowing that these characteristics of water based off of polarity, if water wasn't polar, we would live here. Okay, so beyond the lookout for covalent bonds that exhibit polarity, polar bonds, polar covalent bonds, and bonds that do not exhibit polarity, which are non polar covalent okay. bonds. We're going to see those two types of covalent bonds all over biological systems. Another form of a strong bond is the ionic bond. So we got, uh, in this example here, sodium and chlorine. You will notice that both have three energy shells. Sodium has one electron in its outer shell. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. They can form an ionic bond. And the way that an ionic bond works is remember that electrons are always looking for a part. Ionic bonds can form when an electron is not shared equally or shared through a covalent bond, but rather is transferred from one atom to another. So the electron is transferred from one atom to another. Whenever we do that, we are transferring one charge, right? We're passing a charge from one molecule to another. So the charge of those atoms change as well. Because we have an unbalanced number of electrons to protons. In the case of sodium and chlorine, the sodium molecule loses its electron. And in doing so, it now is a molecule, or I'm sorry, an atom of sodium that has a complete outer valence shell. But because there is going to be, what is it, 11? Yeah, so 11 protons, 11 electrons. We lose an electron. We now have 10 electrons and 11 protons. The electrons and protons are on balance. We get a net of one plus charge. Chlorine, we're going to get a net of one negative charge. Positive and negative, they attract, right? Positives and negatives always attract. So those positive and negative atoms that are created by the switching of the, uh, of the electron, those charged atoms attract. And when I say attract, I mean literally that they are going to come together. And they're going to form an association. And it's a pretty strong association. It is not a covalent bond because the electrons are not being shared, but rather it's an attractive charge between a 
positive and we are held together. So these atoms become a form called an ion. An ion just simply means they're charged particles or charged atoms. In terms of what we should call them, the atom that lost the electron, which by the way is going to be the lower electronegative, so lower electronegativity in that atom, that atom that lost an electron, it becomes more positive, so we have an increase in its positiveness, and we're going to call that a cation. The atom that gained that electron that was transferred from our cation is going to be the higher electronegative molecule. And that makes sense, right? Because electronegativity is a measure or a quantity that expresses how much force an electron is pulled on. And this becomes increasingly negative. And we call that an anion. It's the negative ion, the negative charge part. So sodium loses that one valence electron and now has a complete shell. It's attracted to the chlorine that's just gained the electron to become more negative. They attract together to form sodium chloride, NaCl, table salt, that exhibits an ionic bond. Now, in terms of biology, these would this would be called an ionic compound. Does anyone happen to know anything about sodium? Sodium in its native form, it has that outer electron that's unpaired. If I take sodium and I throw it in water, and anyone know what happens? It's huge, it's a huge explosion. Huge explosion. It's very reactive. Sodium loses that electron. It forms this ionic compound. Now I take table salt and I throw it into water, what happens? It just dissolves. It doesn't blow up anymore. And when it dissolves, it forms, well, first of all, I'm taking sodium chloride as an ionic compound. I throw it into water, and it dissociates, meaning that the ion bond is broken. And so I end up with a sodium ion and a chloride ion. That sodium ion in the presence of water is not near as reactive as the sodium ion that has the extra electron to get. So ionic compounds, these are what we refer to as salts. And you'll see these all over food packaging. You consume these in your diet. They include things like sodium chloride, NaCl, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, potassium chloride. They're basically going to be compounds where you have a low electronegative molecule like sodium, calcium, or magnesium that donates the electron to chloride, and then they form an ionic bond. And just in a dry environment, you have the ionic compound. You put it into your, or the salt. You put it into water, and it breaks that ionic bond, and you end up with your charged particles. Sodium with a plus one chloride with a minus one. Now these ionic compounds, because biology happens in water, right? Your cells are surrounded by water, your cells contain water in your blood. It's basically a watery environment. Whenever you consume salt, table salt, it's going to dissociate. In fact, it begins to dissociate right in your mouth and the saliva. So in a water environment, the magnesium, which lost its two electrons, becomes a net charge of plus two once in the aqueous environment. 
Now, really what that means in terms of forming ionic compound, if I can lose two electrons, I can give those two electrons to two different single molecules that can accept one electron piece. And so I could give those two electrons, one electron to one molecule of chloride, chlorine I should say, to form chloride, and another electron to another molecule or another atom of chlorine to form another chloride. And then I combine those two chlorines. Each chlorine gaining one electron, so a net charge of minus one. Then once I put that molecule of magnesium chloride into water, I end up with magnesium that has a 2 plus, and I end up with chloride that has a minus 1. And by the way, what we are going to eventually recognize is by putting these ionic compounds into water, I now can conduct electricity to that water. In other words, I can create current and then I can do work with that current. So those are the strong chemical bonds. We will pick up next time. with weak chemical bonds, which are also sometimes referred to as temporary bonds. All right, have a nice afternoon or a nice morning.